I'm going to start this lecture by telling you a little bit about myself and because myself is very much involved in how I got into this research, uh, how I became interested and, and one, one step that led to the next step and so on and so forth. When I was a graduate student, among the most exciting work at that time, and this is the 1960s, was being done by a British scholar called Francis Yates. So let me take you back to Dame Frances Yates. When I knew her, she was Frances Yates. She later received that honorific of being a dame, of the British Empire, I guess that's what you're a dame of. And she was working at that time on the hermetic tradition broadly conceived in the Renaissance and in particular, the life of Giordano Bruno. The book Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition was undoubtedly her most famous and important book came out in 1964, and it brought Bruno back to the attention of scholars in a way in which he had not been before that. One of the extraordinary things, and there are many things extraordinary about Bruno, but perhaps sadly, the most remarkable thing is the way in which he was killed. He was murdered by the Roman Inquisition, burned at the stake alive in the year 1600 in Rome. He was deeply interested in the Hermetic tradition as it had come into the Renaissance from the ancient Greeks. The Hermetic tradition is very complicated and I don't want to take you through the whole of it. What to know about it is that it transmitted a body of knowledge, a body of wisdom that had magic within it. So for example, alchemy belongs to the Hermetic tradition. And it supposedly came from one Hermes Trismegistus, who was an ancient, um, worthy who taught it, it was believed Moses. That's not at all true, but a lot of people believed it. It was particularly the case that the Hermetic tradition made a great impact in Protestant Europe. And we can find it, for example, among Scottish Freemasons of the early 17th century. How did this work out in the for Masonic society and the Masonic way of thinking. Well, part of it is that it transmitted a sense of mysticism, a sense that there were, was other knowledge aside from the orthodox knowledge of the, of the churches and of the universities. And it also appealed to Protestants in particular because of, it was a kind of counter-cultural knowledge, uh, just as Protestantism was counter-cultural to um, the knowledge associated with the churches. The young man, John Toland, who was born in Northern Ireland, and that's where we start to come around full way to, to who I am, was born in Northern Ireland in 1670, and he was almost certainly born a Catholic because he knew Gaelic, and Protestants on the whole never did learn Gaelic. He knew Gaelic, but somewhere along the way, we think he must have converted to Protestantism. He had a long career at, as a uh, uh, Protestant um, and then a heretic. But what I want to mention first and foremost is that we know that in 1696, when he already had his degree from the University of Edinburgh, he found a copy of a work by Giordano Bruno, which was extremely rare. And why was it rare? It was rare because the Roman Inquisition went out of its way to find every copy it could of works by Giordano Bruno and confiscated and burned them. Well, somehow, Tolan got his copy of La Spazio della Bestia Trafonte, and the, it was the work of Giordano Bruno. It became known in English as the Expulsion of the Triumphant Beast, and it was Tolan who arranged for it to be translated. The basic ideas in the expulsion of the, of the triumphant beast are ideas about matter and motion. And these appear uh, to repeat, be per, per, repeated and elaborated upon in Bruno's letters to Serena in 1704. Now, Bruno is a Renaissance figure. He is pre-scientific revolution. And the language he used does not talk as succinctly as people after the scientific revolution will talk about nature. But after the scientific revolution, nature is seen as composed of matter and motion. 
it was absolutely basic to Christian belief that matter is dead, lifeless, and the, the motion that exists in the universe comes to it through God, through spiritual forces. Well, in the Spazio della Vestia Triumphante, Bruno has nature as, as it were, alive. It's able to, to do everything itself, if I can use that metaphor. And he argues, in effect, that motion spirit is inherent in matter. And, it, and this motion spirit matter exists in an infinite universe that is infinite and eternal. And it also contains a number, different, infinite number of worlds. And Bruno is one of the first theorists who argued that there were other worlds and other peoples in the world. That, needless to say, was one of the many things that got him caught as a heretic. In this conception of nature, what will come to be called by Tolan, who's the first person to use this word, and then more generally, it will come to be called pantheism. God is the soul of this world, and God is a part of nature, and nature is a part of God. If Bruno now begins to sound a lot like Spinoza, who lived 40, 50 years after him, it's because Spinoza is imbued by hermetic ideas, among others. And what this hermetic tradition does is it folds into Spinozism. And the key notion here, and there are many important notions, but I'm only going to dwell upon the key one, it is that God and nature are essentially one. This is deeply heretical. One of the fundamentals of Christianity and Islam and Judaism is that God is separate from his creation. So now we have the making in, in Tolan via Giordano Bruno, the making of a really quite serious heretic. Well, Tolan the heretic was born, as I said, in Northern Ireland. And so too was my mother. Indeed, among the earliest things I remember as a child, when we used to go visit my mother's sister in Canada, was a trip to Northern Ireland that I took. And there, one knew about, of course, the Orange Order. If you were Catholic, you especially knew about the Orange Order because they were seen as your persecutors. And the Orange Order and Freemasonry was deeply interconnected in Northern Ireland to the point where it can be said that Freemasonry, Freemasons were hostile to Catholics in Northern Ireland. This is not generally true of Freemasonry, but in this particular setting, a setting determined by English politics, because of course Ireland was Catholic, it was seen as a place where James II, who was a Catholic, had been thrown out of his throne in 1688-89, it was seen as the back door through which he might return to England and once again become monarch. So Protestants in Ireland were seen as almost um, those who held the keys to the kingdom. They pushed back against the possibility of a Catholic takeover of Britain. And of course, my mother knew all about this. And I knew, grew up knowing about the Freemasons, about at least my mother's versions of the Freemasons. And when I went to Ireland, I saw them marching in their wonderful colorful garbs, and here's an example of a march. And also the fact that Freemasons were very important within this historical context. And that was something to be, to worth, be worth knowing as a young historian. Now I would wager you your, that there were not 1% of the population of the graduate schools of North America who knew anything about Freemasonry. This was just one of the sort of accidents of my, my birth and my upbringing. So go back to Tolan now. He's born in Northern Ireland, probably of Catholic parents, but converted to Protestantism. And for reasons we're not sure exactly how this all happens, he winds up going to the University of Edinburgh. Again, a Protestant institution at this time. And there he is a student of the young David Gregory. Gregory was an early teacher of Newton's method and natural philosophy. And an MA there, Tolan got his MA from Gregory in 1690. 
From there, he went on to become almost immediately a student for the Presbyterian ministry. And they in turn put up the scholarship that sent him to the Dutch Republic. From the Presbyterian point of view of the Presbyterian ministry, this was money ill spent. Because Toland did not come back from the Dutch Republic, a more devout Protestant and minister of the church. Unfortunately, he came back a heretic. In the Dutch Republic, he met Benjamin Furley. Now, Furley was an English exile, and he was the son of a regicide who had gone into exile. Now, what is a regicide? This is somebody who actually, in 1649, signed the, the death warrant for Charles I, who, as you remember, was executed by Cromwell, the English Puritans, in 1649. So if you were a, a, a regicide, when the monarchy, monarchy came back in 1690, the only thing, 1670, 1660, sorry, the only thing to do was to leave the country. And so the young Furley, taken by his family, goes to the Dutch Republic, where his Protestant is safe, and they become residents of Rotterdam. Now, Furley was a, a significant intellectual who influenced a lot of people and knew just about everybody. The family was well off, and Furley, through his friends in the Dutch Republic, acquired one of the finest libraries in Europe. Now, let me hesitate here and point out that in the year 1700, half of the books in Europe were produced in the Dutch Republic. If you are one of these people, like myself, who goes into a bookstore and can hardly stop buying something, that was what Benjamin Furley was. Furley ac accumulated one of the finest libraries in all of Europe. And through his connections back in England and through his own learning and through his library, which everybody wanted to see, Furley got to know John Locke. And John Locke, in turn, was one of the people to whom Toland had been introduced. So here you have Toland getting to know Furley through Locke and probably also through Furley, many of the French Huguenot refugees who had fled to the Dutch Republic by 1710. Remember that the French king, Louis XIV, in 1685, revoked the Edict of Nantes. And for you, those of you for whom the Edict of Nantes is not uh, on the top of your head, it was the edict that gave a religious freedom of sorts to French Protestants. Well, in 1685, Louis XIV revoked it. Well, at that point, there were only so many things you could do if you were a French Protestant. One was to convert back to Catholicism and get in the good graces of the government. Two, flee the country, but that was not easy. You were not being given passports. This was not allowed to Protestants. The third option, which many people wound up with, was going to jail. So by 1710, I use that as a sort of um, a 25 year marker after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, parts of Amsterdam had actually become French. There were French cafes and French um, salon, French uh, bistro, and a significant population of French-speaking refugees. Many of them got to know Furley. They borrowed books from his library. They saw him as, in effect, as a friend. And this is the moment that we want to bring Toland into the story. He becomes a friend of, of Furley. We don't know how close, but we know that he spent time with Furley. And we also know that he used Furley's library. And then we know from the manuscripts that John Tolan left behind that sit to this day in the British Library, Tolan had met a group of mostly French Huguenot refugees. They were a collection. They were a melange of different people. 
And they called themselves the Knights of Jubilation. We don't know where they came from. We don't know why they called themselves the Knights of Jubilation. But we know from a manuscript in Tolan's library, dated November 24th, 1710, the Knights of Jubilation were having a nice fancy evening. The occasion was that one of them was about to get married. And the record of that particular meeting begins with a list of everything they ate. Pigeons, pular, chapon, um, ham, it, the list goes on and on. The other thing it contains is a list of what they drank, which was prodigious. Indeed, when you read the register, which is what this document is called, of the this one meeting of the Knights of Jubilation, and by the way, it's in the handwriting of a man called Prosper Marchand. What you see is that in the course of the handwriting, it deteriorates and deteriorates and deteriorates. And this has something to do, I suspect, with what was being drunk that evening. One of the things that you see in this register is that it talks about every brother is a brother. Every member is a frere. These are, again, this is a French speaking group. And they are meeting under their constitutions, plural, which by which they mean the statutes and reg regulations of their order. In 1710, the word constitution in French did not mean statutes and regulations. It meant your physical constitution, your health, how, you're, how you were, how is your constitution? The legally sounding, politically sounding meaning of the word is an English import that is first used in this context. This is, does not appear in print in, the, in this context, but it does within 10 years appear as the constitution of a group. But what's unusual about this usage is that this constitution here is plural. Those of you who know Masonic history know that when the Constitutions of the Freemasons was first published in 1723, it too was plural, probably referring to the fact that there were many different lodges, all of which had constitutions. The, there's many important things about this manuscript, but one of the best things about it is that it's signed. We actually know some of the people who were there that evening. Michael Boehm, the singer of the order, and Gleditch were almost certainly German visitors. They are booksellers and publishers. Um, our, our host was telling me that there's a Boehm family in Harlem, uh, and it may indeed be related. It, for all I know, this Boehm came from Harlem, but he's related because he publishes also in Germany. Charles Livier, who's the buffoon and the harlequin of the order, is a French refugee. And then there are two names that will remain important for this story. The one is Bernard Picard, and the other is Prosper Marchand. Bernard Picard, in 1710, when he signs this, or actually, that's not his signature, all of this has been written in the hand of Prosper Marchand. In 20 years, Bernard B. Picard will become one of the most famous engravers in Europe. He was immensely talented, and Marchand and Picard are very close friends. They were born Catholic, and in their youth, well after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1785, they converted to Protestantism. This is an extraordinary, why do something like that and put yourself in jeopardy when Protestantism has been illegal since 1685? Picard and Marchand leave the, the, the French, they are able to get a passport and travel because of course nobody knows that in their hearts they're no longer Catholic. Not entirely clear that they're really Protestant, but they present themselves now as Catholics, they get a passport, and off they go to the Dutch Republic. And they came in the year of this document, came that winter of 16, of 1709-10. And this document is 
10 months later, it's in November. And here they are, members of the Knights of Jubilation. It'd be a little easier to see the names printed out. And they have titles, and there are other people present who will call one another brothers, but we don't know who they were. We can guess, but we'll perhaps never know. Let me just say that there is no other evidence for this particular group. This is the only document found in Toland's papers that, that we have that tells us something about the fact that they existed. Well, what does it tell us? Let me, first of all, let's ask ourselves, who were the Knights of Jubilation? Let's note that the occasion for this conversation about them, this meeting, this register, is the coming of age of, of, of one of them and his plans to marry. So marriage is upcoming. So what do we have here? Do we have a stag party? Do we have a feasting and drinking society? Well, we certainly have that. And do we have a Masonic Lodge? We have everybody meeting there under a Grand Master. Fritch is the Grand Master. Remember, go, go back to those um, See, he's crossed out his name, but it's, he is a, he's labeled as the Grand Maitre. So we know that they call another brother, they have a Grand Master, they meet under their constitutions, which are the statutes and rules of their order. Are they officially Masonic? Well, there is no official Freemasonry in this period. So the best I could ever do with this manuscript was to argue that they were all three. But there's something going on here that is larger than a stag party. It's even more fun, perhaps, than a feasting and drinking society. It's an English import because of the language that's being used. And it's something or somebody that Tolan would have known. And we know from other sources that Tolan was associated with a man called Robert Clayton in London and he ran a Masonic Lodge in the 1690s. And there are clearly these Masonic elements. They meet under a constitution, they call one another brother, they're led by a grand master. Their record appears in the papers of someone who was familiar with Freemasonry. We know that Tolan knew Clayton, and indeed he had been recommended to Clayton's group as a, to be a member. We don't know what exactly this group was, but Clayton is clearly has a clear association with the 1690s Masonic, Masonic groups in London. The other thing we need to know is that Prosper Marchand, the secretary of the order, the man whose handwriting, as I said, deteriorates as um, events go on in the course of the evening. We know that he was a close friend all his life of Jean Rousset de Missy. Jean Rousset de Missy, by the 1740s, 30 years after this manuscript, has become a leader of Amsterdam Freemasonry and a participant in the revolution of 1747. Rousset de Missy also knew Locke's work extremely well, and he brought out a French translation of Locke's two treatises of government. Rousset de Missy operated as an agent for the Austrian government. Remember, Austria is the great enemy of France in this period. And he also is a patron, uh, receiving patronage from an allegiance to the House of Orange. Rousset de Missy was indeed a French Protestant refugee and he left behind his father who was imprisoned in France. So Rousset de Missy is bitter, He's angry, he's extremely learned, he's very, very apt with his pen. And we know that he's a close friend of Prosper Marchand. And then all we know about him is that he becomes a part of Amsterdam Freemasonry and indeed one of its leaders. Does this say that Prosper Marchand was a Freemason? 
Well, we have no evidence exactly of that. We know he was blown to the Knights of Jubilation. Do the Knights of Jubilation lead to Freemasonry in the Netherlands? Officially, not really. The uh, official masonry begins in The Hague in 1731. But somehow all this is connected in ways that we will probably never know unless more manuscripts turn up that will help us understand all of this. So now we have an interesting collection of people involved in politics, anti-French, bitterly anti-French, pro-English, residing in the Dutch Republic, one of whom becomes a leader of Freemasonry. All of them are pro-Orange, anti-French, and some of them go on to have a really quite significant intellectual life. And the most significant part of this intellectual life that we see among the Knights of Jubilation is the publishing career of Bernard Picard and his close friend, Jean-Frédéric Bernard. And Frédéric Bernard, by the way, was another Protestant refugee. Picard gets called a Protestant refugee, but we, we know that in fact, he was born a Catholic. He migrated to some kind of Protestantism and from private manuscripts in his papers, which by the way, turn up in the Marchand papers. And the Marchand papers are voluminous. And in them, you can find just about everything you need to know about Bernard Picard and Prosper Marchand and Jean-Frédéric Bernard. And those papers are housed at the University Library in Leiden. Frederick, uh, John Frederick Bernard and Prosper Marshall decided to, uh, they did various publishing ventures, but they became fascinated with the history of the world's religions. They wanted to know everything they could find out about all the religions of the world. This is now the 1720s. And with Picard as the engraver, and it's under his name that these ceremonies et coutumes religieuses of all the peoples of the world first appear under his name. And to this day, every library catalog lists this seven, actually nine folio volume work as being by Bernard Picard. Although the actual publisher was Jean Frederic Bernard. Bernard wrote some of the pieces in it. He, he uh, copied other things. They had other people write for them. This was a, an omnibus enterprise. What's important about this ceremonies and religious customs of all the peoples of the world is this is a first attempt anywhere ever to treat all the religions of the world as worthy of respect, as interesting, as similar, and dissimilar, but to, to, as it were, make them an object of study, not a polemical piece that to, so the Catholics can attack Protestants and Protestants can attack Catholics and they all attack the Muslims and of course everybody attacked the Jews. This is not an attack weapon, it's far from it. And that's the frontispiece, which is absolutely beautiful. We could give it a big enough piece. And you see in the bottom, there's, there's Mohammed preaching. And there's a, that's a symbol of the Catholic Church in the center, and behind her, the great reformers, Luther and Calvin and so forth. And this is all of the peoples of the world assembled in various religions. The point about this work is that we now see it as an early example of the European Enlightenment. It, in effect, preached toleration of all religions, and it also you treated them as all of a piece, all worthy of knowing. But are they all true? Well, is any one of them true? Ceremonies and religious customs of all the peoples of the world doesn't suggest that any one of them is true. It's that they all have some kind of truth. And embedded in this volume is the first pictorial representation of Freemasonry. We have, this is the earliest engraving we have that depicts a Masonic Lodge. The Lodge is meeting in England. What you can see behind you, and very, very far up at the top, I'm not sure it's coming through very well, is the name Sir Richard Steele. 
and he's being shown as a kind of leading Freemason. Indeed, he was a Freemason. All these different cards that look like greeting cards almost are uh, from various coffee houses and taverns, and each is from a different lodge. There are 129 of them by the time this thing is published, and Bernard Picard is its engraver. From other sources of the time, we know that the, the chair, for example, that you can see in the um, various, um, the trowel, etc., the, the, um, um, the thing that you use to measure a corner, I'm forgetting its exact name, all of these things were commonplace in Freemasonry in this period. Does this mean that Picard and Bernard are Freemasons? We don't know. Depends on what you think about the Knights of Jubilation. It depends on whether you think that jean frederic Bernard is a member of the Knights. But we do know that these are folks who knew an awful lot about English Freemasonry. At a period when officially Masonry had not yet made its way to the continent. Except, of course, we know that that's a very complicated story. Freemasonry was first established in the Dutch Republic officially in The Hague in 1734, Paris in the late 1720s. Now, we know about what went on in Paris in this period because the French police, and we as historians, I suppose, have to thank them, the French police watched everything they could get their eyes on, and they were very nervous about this group that met and called themselves Freemasons. And they kept a record. The spies, the authorities wrote to the spies and said, tell us what's going on and why are they doing these, these e events? Why are they having a convocation to elect a master of the lodge? Why did you turn over to a notary the results of the elections? The police say, we don't know exactly, but we know that all association is always dangerous to the state, especially if it takes place on the secret and the, with the appearance of religion. Why the appearance of religion? Because they wore aprons, they had special garments. And what's interesting also about these police supply, police su supplied records, and by the way, you can see those reports at the Library of Arsenal in Paris. They tell us the occupations of the men who were meeting on that occasion and who they were and what they did. A jeweler, a, an official at the poultry market, a gardener, a tapestry merchant, an actor in the Comédie Italienne, quote, a Negro who serves as a trumpeter in the king's lodge, in the king's guard, a wine merchant, three Benedictine priests, a valet at court, and in the summer of 1744, four unmarried women. Now, wait a minute, they'll say. These are Freemasons? Well, the spies certainly say they're Freemasons. We have every reason to believe that the spies are not lying. And that what they see is what they're recording will, in effect, treat them like our anthropologists. Benedictine priests, women, and most extraordinary, perhaps of all, at all, a black trumpeteer in the king's guard. Now, there were such people. They were brought in from Africa and hired, and it was meant to show how what a big deal you were as a king that you had an African in your army. The Dutch did the same thing, by the way. An actor. Now, actors were got regarded in this period as lower forms of life. They were not equals. But yet here he is, along with a black man from Africa, along with wine merchants, and three priests another valet at court, and four women, all meeting together in what the spies call a Masonic meeting. Well, is this masonry or is it not? I mean, what, what are we looking at here? Well, let's, let's try to piece together what it is the police are telling us 
about what was the earliest forms of Freemasonry to be found in Europe, in Britain, but here now in Paris in the 1740s. There's a structure, there's somebody in charge, they're meeting in, in a way in which they, they seem to have rules and regulations. They use rituals and they have ceremonies. They're serious, in other words. And what's interesting, they're imitating forms of governance. They have officers. They're going to a notary to record their, their documents so that they have an official standing, a legal standing. But what I've concluded, what I concluded at the time when I first wrote about these folk, and I've subsequently come, well, of course, once you have a thesis, you always, almost always stay with it. But other things that I found all, in my mind, support my argument that what we're looking at here in this early form of civil society, this is not politics, this is not a religion, but it has the appearance of some things political and some things religious. What we have here is a new form of civil society. This is a meeting that's separate from government, separate from the church, separate from the family. It includes men and women, and those in working in the British Masonic tradition will be upset by that, but I'm sorry, the earliest European continental records show women in the lodges. They're always a minority report. They're always controversy, controversial, but they were there. What, in effect, we're looking at here, I believe, is a school of government. A form of civil society that is not religion, but could be a form of religiosity for someone who took it really seriously. Someone like Rousseau de Missy, Marchand's friend, who used the, the word pantheism, which he got from Tolan, to describe his own religiosity. This is the appearance of civil society outside the family, outside the state, outside the church. And it is also, or could be, an educational experience where men, and by the 1740s, some women could learn. Well, what could they learn? They could speak on, learn how to speak on their feet, how to vote in elections, how to pay dues, how to serve as officers, how to enforce a moral code. Because what these records begin to tell us as we go into Masonic records that begin to appear from that period onward, the lodges had rules of conduct. You, you couldn't be, you, you could have a big party afterwards, but you could not be drunk in your, and, and disorderly. You could be probably drunk, but not disorderly. You had to obey certain rules about behavior in public and in private. And if you didn't, you paid a fine. And if you paid enough fines and you were awful enough, they threw you out. So this is an organization that's operating as a, a, a kind of civil society that is also instilling mores, ways of behaving, and also increasingly tries to come to terms with its history and to, to in effect, find an ancient history for itself. So what you discover within, oh, a decade or two of these meetings is Freemasons who say that they're Rosicrucians, that they descended from the, the prayer of the Rosy Cross, etc. Well, it seems like we've come a long way from Northern Ireland and Fred Francis Yates, or have we? The Hermetic tradition is here in the sermons and the records of the lodges from the mid 18th century onward. There is a religiosity, the grand architect of the universe is to be saluted, is to be seen as uh, a figure in charge, as it were, of the world. The Rosicrucian elements are something that is rediscovered. There's no continuous history 
of Rosicrucianism here. And I can, in a diversion, I can talk a bit about that. But by the 1760s, you have lodges that are taking Rosicrucian names and talking about the Rosy Cross. And so again, it's picking up the Hermetic tradition rather self-consciously by the last quarter of the 18th century. You still have the guild structure, and these things are descended from the guild structure. Namely, they have officers, they have elections as a grand master. One another are called brothers. All of this is commonplace in the Masonic guilds that built the churches and were everywhere to be seen in Europe, but were not Freemasonry until the late 17th century in England. There are vestments, aprons, secret words, and handshakes. But again, the apron, secret words, and handshakes are an extrapolation from the guilds. The guilds had secret words. Why did they have secret words? Because guild members had to travel, sometimes long distances. And in order to work at the site of a cathedral building or a city hall being built or whatever, you had to have something that identified you as a working mason and your secret word was what did it for you. So we have a melange here, a mixing together of the hermetic tradition, of the guild structure, of what becomes Freemasonry by the, by the middle of the 18th century. You have all sorts of people in these lodges. They are not working Masons. They wouldn't know how to build a wall if it fell into their hands. But they have all of the trappings and um, aspects of an official society that teaches morals, teaches how to speak, how to elect members, how to have discipline, how to obey, etc. So what I would argue is that what we have happening here in the middle of the 18th century in France and elsewhere is the formation of schools of government. Now, in the midst of all this, there is within the lodges a de democratic ethos or ideology, if you like. Why? Why do I say democratic? Because these are people who are meeting upon the level. They treat one another as equals. But in fact, they're not equals. If you look at the membership, of the lodges that we know by the middle of the 18th century, there's always some aristocratic leadership somewhere. And then you have a lot of bourgeois. And occasionally you get somebody like an actor or in The Hague, in the lodge that met for men and women, you actor who have actors and actresses from the Comédie Française. And these are not people who, um, um, know anything about building, they've come to a, a embrace a society that's taken on all kinds of affectations, uh, brotherly love, um, uh, the hermetic tradition. And one of the most important Masons of the middle of the 18th century, the man to whom I'll come back uh, here now as I close my remarks, is Jean Rousset de Missy. He was a French Protestant refugee. His father died in prison back in France. He is an agent, as I said, for the Austrian government. In other words, he's an enemy of France. He hates the French king and the French, ki and the French church. In his private letters, he refers to himself as a pantheist. And he becomes one of the leaders in the Dutch Revolution of 1747 that had a big British component in it that restored the Stadtholderate to the Dutch Republic. The only problem was that Rousset de Missy was more radical than the leaders of the Dutch Revolution. He wanted to see a complete reform of society. And eventually, because of his extreme attitudes, he was sent into exile for quite a while after the revolution. So he's one of the very first examples we have of someone whose who's Freemasonry is part of 
a general political stance, I think in his case, that is deeply anti-French, anti-Catholic, and interested in trying to find new forms of government, new ways of creating a society that will treat men with dignity and respect and treat them as if they are all equals, even though in fact they are not. So in a curious kind of way, we also have in these very early lodges, the beginnings of a democratic ethos. It will take a very, very long time for that ethos to become reality. And indeed, in many countries, especially my own, that reality is a, is a dream, not true. So I'm happy now to take questions and I hope that you've been interested to some degree in all of these Freemasons. Thank you.